All righty. Um, I think we've got about 45 people on live now, so I think we might, um, we might make a start. So good morning, everybody. As you know, I'm Andy, uh, ED Strategy and Engagement. Um, I'm going to uh, facilitate today's celebration and learning event for United Nations International Day of People with Disabilities. Um, we're going a little bit early. The, the official day is the 3rd of December, um, but of diaries and availabilities, this is probably the best time to do it. Um, so my connection with disability um, is as the executive sponsor of the SPIDA project um, and also as a member of the National Roadmap uh, for Improving the Health of People with Intellectual Disability um, Governance Group. So I do that with the Commonwealth. Um, and I'm also a director and vice president of Melba Support Services, who provides support to about 1,100 people with intellectual disability across Victoria. Um, before we begin today, um, we're going to start with an acknowledgement from Auntie Jane, um, who many of you will know, and that, that'll be done as a short video. So I think, Nicole, you'll um, run that. Hi, everybody. My name's Auntie Jane, and I'd like to begin by paying my respects to the Wondery people, to the all the traditional custodians of this land on in, in Victoria, on where we are meeting upon today, for its aunties, uncles, brothers, sisters, nanas, pops, and everybody else, and people with an intellectual disability as well, for the traditional custodians of this land on where we are meeting upon today for its elders past and present. Thank you everybody from Auntie Jane. Thanks, um, thanks Auntie Jane. Uh, great to have you and we'll have a little bit more I think from Auntie Jane a bit later in the morning. Um, I also want to acknowledge um, as we do that uh, Western Victoria acknowledges the traditional owners of the unceded lands and waterways, so the Wadawurrung, Gulichan, Gadabunud, Kirei Wurrung, Peak Wurrung, Gunditjmara, Jabwurrung, Wachabulak, Jajawurrung, Jadwajali, Wagaya, Jubbagulk and Jadwa peoples. And we recognise their diversity and resilience and the ongoing place that First Peoples hold in our communities. We pay our respects to Elders both past and present and commit to working together in the spirit of mutual understanding, respect and reconciliation and support self-determination for First Nations, peoples and organisations. Um, and I just acknowledge that I'm on Watcher Bullock country today in the Horsham office. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge um, people with lived experience of disability. Um, so we acknowledge people with lived experience of disability, as well as their families, carers, disability services and advocates. We recognise their strength, courage and unique perspective as a vital contribution to our work to learn, grow and achieve better outcomes together. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the SPIDER team, so particularly to Kerry and Nicole, who have been passionate drivers um, and advocates for people with um, intellectual disability. So thank you very much, guys, for putting all this together today. Um, as a further acknowledgement, I want to acknowledge that Australia is a signatory to the UN Nations, United Nations Convention on the Rights of People, Persons with Disabilities, um, and in particular, the two articles we want to emphasise, so Article 25 in relation to health, that persons with disabilities have the right to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of health without discrimination on the basis of disability, and Article 9 on accessibility, that persons with disabilities have the right to access medical facilities and emergency services on an equal basis to others in the community. And the work of SPIDER is making sure that we actually support people to achieve those two um, outcomes. Um, so today's presentation has been brought together by the SPIDER team, um, who are supporting people with intellectual disability to access health, which is what the acronym stands for. Um, and that's part of the primary care enhancement um, project um, that underpins the national roadmap for improving the health of people with intellectual disability. So we're going to play a short video now from Jack and Laura, who are going to speak about the National Roadmap um, and sets the scenes for the work that SPIDER does today and the speakers we'll hear from later today. So thanks, Nicole. Australia's healthcare system is one of the best 
in the world. Most Australians consider themselves to be in good health. But health outcomes are so much worse for people like me, living with intellectual disability. Between 1 and 2% of people have an intellectual disability. We experience double the avoidable deaths, worse physical and mental health. Lower rates of preventative health like vaccinations. Many of us use multiple medications. An Australian study found on average we die 27 years younger. Many of us have complex health conditions that are difficult to diagnose. And sometimes the signs of illness are not so clear. Communication can be harder in both directions. But we want to be healthy and we have right to good health care. Great, thank you to um, Laura and um, and Jack. Um, so today we're celebrating the International Day for People with a Disability, which aims to increase awareness, uh, public awareness and understanding and acceptance of people with disability and pro provides an opportunity for us to make a positive difference um, to the lives of 4.4 million Australians. Um, just reflect on that number, 4.4 million Australians who have a disability. Each year, the United Nations announces a theme to observe for the International Day of People with Disability. Um, and we're running this session, as I said, um, a bit early. The actual day is the 3rd of December. Um, the annual theme provides an overarching focus on how society can strive for inclusivity through the removal of physical, technological and attitudinal barriers uh, for people with disability. This has been occurring since 1992 when the General Assembly first created the International Day. So the theme for this year is United in Action to Rescue and Achieve the Sustainable Development Goals for, with and by persons with disabilities. So we'll go through some stuff today which might be a little bit um, uh, distressing for some people. Um, so there's always the help lines available and we've got the EAP services available to staff. So we've got a big, big agenda today. Um, so we're going to include hearing from experts with lived experience. So Uli and Auntie Jane uh, will have people from the spider funded peer support workers um, across uh, mental health services in uh, the Grampians region. Um, and then we'll hear from a couple of GP clinics who are providing specialised services. Um, and then we'll round out the morning with um, uh, a bit of commentary from uh, Rob Ward, who's been a great um, supporter of the SPIDER project and uh, a real uh, leader in this space. So I'd like to introduce our first speaker today. Um, Uli Cartwright um, is a person with disability from Melbourne um, and is the founder and director of Life is a Battlefield. Uli is a disability advocate, public speaker and consultant working with government, nonprofit and private organisations. Uli uses his lived experience to help the development of ideas, policies and approaches that aim to improve services and supports for people with disabilities. Uli is employed as a valid age um, advisor with Ballad, which is the Victorian Advocacy League, League for Individuals with Disability. In this role, Uli, Uli is part of a team that uh, visits disability accommodation services where he meets with residents. They discuss people's rights and any concerns or challenges they may be experiencing uh, with a report compiled after each visit. Uli is a member of the NDIA Participant uh, First Reference Group, uh, which is a group that meets monthly and prov provides advice and guidance to various business areas with the, in the NDIA. Uli has contributed as part of broader working group to the development of Bill Amanta's strategic plan. At the end of 2022, he gave evidence to the Disability Royal Commission hearing into guardianship and administration. 
Bullying is the first person with disability to hold the position of client engagement officer at Life Without Barriers. And recently he has collaborated with Mabel to develop material for social for the social media platform, speaking about his experience of using the Mabel platform. Bully is always open to meeting and collaborating with like-minded people who have a passion for upholding human rights, people who don't shy away from challenging political, current political systems to improve the lives of people with disabilities. Um, I'll now hand over to um, to Uli. Thank you, Andrew. Um, and thank you for having me. Um, I would also like to repeat um, and acknowledge the lived experience that's out there. I think um, it's super important. Um, now, I don't know where to start because that seems like a very, very long, like, rap sheet. Um, I'm a 28 year old person with disability. My movie came out um, on the 3rd of December or 4th of December on 2019. Um, as SBS wanted to do something to celebrate that. Um, and that all started based off <clears throat> wanting to strip back a curtain on what it is like to have a disability and just be myself and be who I am. Um, ironically, my producer told me many, many, many years later, the only reason why he started filming with me was because I was in intensive care and he thought I was going to die. And I'm like, Thanks. Thanks, mate. Um, so we compiled a whole bunch of short videos together um, and it it was half done. ABC said no order originally. Um, SBS turned around and said, we don't have anything to, you know, celebrate with. So, yeah, we'll take it. Um, since then, I've gone to the Disability Royal Commission um, and I... And the reason why I went to the Disability Royal Commission was when I brought my movie out, I was on guardianships, um, financial administration. And I, um, one of the scenes in my movie was me celebrating coming off that order and being able to do and like have a new lease on life and do things. In doing that, I actually broke the law. There's a law that says that you can't speak publicly about your experiences. Um, so I went to the Disability Royal Commission and spoke about that. And <clears throat> I'm in the process of trying to get the Victorian Attorney General to change the VCAT legislation um, because it's a one-liner, you know, unless, um, unless private, it's a private and confidentiality law where, you know, unless the tribunal says otherwise, you can't speak publicly about your experiences. Um, quite literally one line um and i'm going to be what the in what the you know the intro to me says i believe that it's very paternalistic and very protective protectivism there is there is as we are going into a society where people with disability can defend themselves um whether they're right or wrong they have a voice um and we need to stop um, being in a rush to meet outcomes and we need to stop and understand um, what they're trying to say. Um, as soon as yesterday, I was in an NDIA working group and I completely lost my mind because something very small happened and I got told by other people with lived experience on peak bodies that I needed to calm down or that they were trying to justify, oh yeah, we, we get you, but we understand why the government did that. I don't particularly care. So I think people are very quick to rush into doing stuff and we need to stop and listen. Um, I said to them afterwards, when I get loud, I get loud, not because I'm angry, because I'm not being heard. When I get aggressive, I'm demanding attention because my trauma is triggered. I'm happy to admit that. But if I'm saying the same thing three different ways, you're obviously not understanding what I'm trying to say. Or you are understanding, but that thing's really important to me. What am I getting at? What have I got up to now? I don't know. Um, I just really had, I just had a neuropsych assessment recently and found out that I actually don't have an intellectual disability, which is very profound to me 
which goes into a you know identity crisis of I identify as someone that still needs help. Um, and I 110 percent agree that you know if I didn't have the support that I still do, I wouldn't be able to do what I do. Um, for example, as I was sitting here, um, my staff member next to me f f saw that I was fidgeting with something, so she grabbed it. She went and go and grab some tape without me even saying anything because she knew my ADHD was like completely off the rails. So it's small things that people need to accommodate. Um, I recently got appointed to um, the Villamanta Border Management. Um, so that's a disability legal service that I actually know Jane Rosenberg Rosen, Rosenberg from. Um, also, Laura and I are a part of, she's the New South Wales representative for Inclusion Australia. Um, so I did recently get appointed to that, but obviously I'm not eligible anymore. Um, and what else am I doing? Um, changing the law. How's my health been? My health has been... My health has been more stable. Me and my health have a love-hate relationship. Um, it decides to crack the shit, and I'm just like, nope, we're going to do this. And then it bites you in the ass two weeks later and says, ha -ha, you, you, you're going to hospital for three weeks. I told you to stop. But, you know, it is what it is. Um, and I think if I, if, if I had to get you guys to take away anything from the Royal Commission, I said this to the NDI, I said this to the deputy CEO yesterday, the NDIA, we need to be not trauma informed. We need to be trauma sensitive. The media has pummeled people with disability to try and help us. But there are stories that have come out that the media automatically assumes that if you're verbal and got an intellectual disability, you're not going to sympathize to the people that are nonverbal. But you need to remember that when you plaster things that we very much know happens in this sector, it hurts. I still feel like I'm one of them. I still advocate for them. I will still take a bullet for them. I'll, I'll stand in front of a government bureaucrat if I need to, whether I'm right or wrong. But I think people with intellectual disability in particular have slipped through the cracks because we don't look like we have a disability. And the DRC has shown us that we expect more and we need to expect more and we will expect more. Some people think the DRC recommendations haven't gone far enough. I think they did because where people say, oh, they haven't told us this, they haven't told them that, well, that's not their style. Their style was to gather the evidence, give us the facts, and give it back to the advocacies, advocates, give it back to the grassroots so they can do what they need to do. So we need to stop and think. And from a health perspective, all the discrimination you see and all the uh, bureaucracy and red tape is very well still in the healthcare system. I have a medical supportive decision maker for the simple fact that I had a major run in with my health. And because I was tired of three weeks of being in hospital and there was a possibility of me dying, I said, let's just do it. And I got told I should go talk to my mum. So I'm like, no, I need to appoint a medical guardian just in case you try and undermine me and pull the rug under from me. Nah, no, nah, not going to happen. So it's, it still happens. It's, it's still there and we need to be more sensitive and we need to take the time because if we start rushing into solutions in the situation that we're in, people are going to check out and they're not coming back. Since instead, the only thing that I believe, I uh, could be wrong, the last win that people with disability had was shutting down institutions. Then we started getting ignored again. Been 40 years, uh, we're, we're, we've been reinvigorated and we need to do it properly. So I, I, I don't feel like I contribute much compared to some other people that I'm involved in, but I am very strong about being the devil's advocate and just, I'm a word Nazi. It's all about the words.
It's all about how something is perceived. I had um, the CEO of Urella and Life Lab Barrows um, support my law reform, and they forgot to put accountability. I'm just like, you put transparency, but not accountability. Some people think, why do I work with services? Because I don't believe in this anti-establishment, you know, us against them mentality. Do I trust them? No. Do they have a louder voice than I do? Yes. And the sad reality is they have a louder voice because who are you going to believe? Who's easier to discredit? A service provider that's got a bunch of lawyers and a PR department or a person with disability that has a bunch of lived experience that they will never be able to, you know, change their mind, but doesn't have the resources. That is why we need to stop and listen. And that is why we need to understand. Because Jane Rosenfeld, I know her personally. She's loud, she's proud, she's flamboyant, and she's bloody out there. But if you listen to her, she has so much insight. So much insight. So I'm not sure. I probably missed out on things. I, there's probably more I can say, but I think I don't know. What would you what what should you do on International Day with Disability? Um I don't know. Scroll Facebook and find something that's mundane. Go to a read a newsletter. Um have a think about watch a news article from ABC, Four Corners Report. Have a have a think about what they're not telling you or what they're missing out. Try and open your mind to different perspectives. That's all I'm going to say. And we have a voice and we're going to use it. So you either listen or it's just all going to fall apart. I hope that was positive. That sounds very depressing from my part, but thank you for having me, Andrew. And if there's any yeah. questions in chat or ask me anything, by all means, I'll answer it. Right. Thanks very much, Uli. And, and I think, you know, that very clear message about slowing down and listening is something that we should apply, you know, for, for anybody in the intellectual disability space, but really for anything that we do, there's too much of not listening and running too fast. And everyone's too, everyone's like just in a rush. They're mm -hmm. just trying to fix it for us because, you know, we don't have any experience. Well, just yep. slow down. And, and we're not scary. Ask us questions. Yep. Yeah, and and I think that's my my learning is um, don't assume, don't make assumptions. Take the time, ask the question, and you know, um, try and understand what people are really wanting, and that's that's the key to it. So, and why and why they yeah. want it? Yeah, whether exactly. whether it's because, whether they want a teddy because it makes them feel comfortable, or whether they want to wait an hour and a half for their parent to be there, or whether. They want sleeping pills because they, you know, are being abused in their day service. Like, I don't know, it could be anything. But yeah, you've got to understand yeah. why. There's always a reason. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, yeah, so so I think, you know, that that's uh, something that we should just all take on board is taking the time to listen and um, taking the time to really understand and I think that's the that's the key to it so so thank you very much Uli and, and you can no see why um Uli is so in demand as a speaker and advocate because he he has strong a strong message and um very consistently so so um, thank um you. last but not least I'm seeing all the comments chat um coming up I'm not captivating speaker the I, I have the amazing ability to be very harsh but also give you a gentle landing I'm just I'm just honest and I'm a realist, but thank you for the kind comments. I don't, yeah. I don't feel like I'm anything special, but thank you. Right. Th thanks, Uli. And um, we're going to um, keep moving on because we've got a packed day, and I think we've got um, uh, Auntie Jane up next. So I want to welcome Auntie Jane to share some information with us. Um, many of us have met Auntie Jane before. Um, she has lived experience of intellectual disability. She's a very strong self advocate and identifies as a First Nations woman from Yorta Yorta country up near Shepparton. Um, she's represented Australia in the Special Olympics in swimming. 
Um, and amongst other things, she's also the recipient of the Tony Fitzgerald Memorial Award at the Australian Human Rights Awards. Um, but, um, so the Tony Fitzgerald Memorial, Memorial Community Award is awarded to an individual um, with a person of a personal track record of promoting and advancing human rights in the Australian community on a not-for-profit basis, and Jane, Auntie Jane's certainly been doing that. Um, <clears throat> Auntie Jane's been supporting the SPIDER project um, on the reference group and with the delivery and training as a coordinator alongside Kerry um, on inclusive best practice in healthcare for people with an intellectual disability. Um, the training sessions have been delivered more than 20, 25 times to hundreds of local health professionals right across Western Victoria. Um, and uh, Auntie Jane's also recently joined our newly formed um, community council, so she'll be participating in community council sessions next year. Um, so I just want to share now a video from Auntie Jane. I'm here today with a group called SPIRA, and SPIRA stands for Supporting People with an Intellectual Disability Access Health. And they've been going since last year. And what we do, we go out and do talks to doctors, nurses, um, at reception staff as well. And what we do, we get the person with a disability, if they've got to go to the doctor, they've got to first see the reception staff. And the reception staff has to make sure that they have to talk to the client, not the, not the nurse. And then after that, once they feel comfortable, that's when the reception staff can say, do you want a glass of water? Do you want to sit down on your own? Or do you want to sit with the other people? And then they let the reception staff know what they want. Then after that, when the doctor calls their name, it's totally up to them if they want the nurse to come in with them or if they want to be on their own. Because when they see the doctor, the doctor has to make sure that they look at the client, not the staff. And speak in plain English, less jargon, any words that they don't understand, they, the doctor has to pay attention and explain it to them. And even, for, even in pictures as well. When I go into the Aboriginal Health Service, what, what things make a health import, important for me, an appointment as well, is that when I go in there, we've got to put a mask on. We have to still at the Aboriginal Health Service. Then they welcome the people that come in to see a doctor or a nurse or a, um, or an eye specialist or that there, or even a physio as well, which we have there, or even, even just to pick up your medication as well. And what they do, I feel really, really welcome at home there because it feels like if, um, if it's my family that's supporting me there as well, even um, when I'm there, I know a lot of Aboriginal people and I say hi to them, I do. And I, um, you know, just feel very welcome there because they um, make yourself feeling like if you're at home. The reason why I think this, is a, this training is very important is to get the professionals who think that they are professionals where they might not have no training on people dealing with people with an intellectual disability. Um, the reason why I come with you to do that is to teach them how to welcome and how to treat people with an intellectual disability to be welcome into the community and Aboriginal people as well with disabilities into the community just like anybody else, not to leave them out not to leave them away from a gap from ordinary people to people with a disability. That's gone from the past, that has. We need to accept people with any, with any disabilities, even if, they are, uh, even if they need a lot of help or just a little bit of help. You have to accept them into the community and into the reception to see doctors and nurses, dentists, hospitals, you know, anything, police stations, health services, 
anything. Thank you. Thanks, Santi Jane. Um, always terrific. And um, every time I see Auntie Jane, her message just gets more and more passionate and loud. So terrific and great to have her joining our community council. Okay, so um, we're now gonna sort of jump into some of the work that um, spider has been doing. So I now wanna welcome uh, Michaela O'Neill and Kayla McGavin, who are from Headspace Warrnambool Brophy Family and Youth Services. So the Spider Project has funded a youth peer support worker, uh, mental health, role to promote inclusion and accessibility for young people with intellectual disability experiencing mental health. Adolescent years are a time of great change in everyone's lives and this can often be a tumultuous period for people with intellectual disabilities and maybe a time of the onset of mental health issues and um, dual diagnosis of intellectual disability and mental health is um, really quite common. Um, to share more about this role, I'll introduce our presenters. So Michaela is a Headspace Warnable Spider Youth Peer Worker. Um, at the age of 11, she was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis, which is classified as having a physical disability. Having a disease that only if, that often affects older adults and was it was very tough for her to go through at a young age and having to navigate a lot along the way with healthcare services, education, employment, and so on as a young person. As a youth peer worker, she's using her lived experience to increase primary care service access, improve mental health and wellbeing, as well as helping with promoting an early help seeking behaviour in young people with a disability. Um, Kayla is a Headspace, is Headspace Warrnambool's community awareness and engagement worker. Her role within the team is to engage with the community and build awareness around the mental health and Headspace services across all of the Southwest. With her five years experience in the role and in the community, she supports Michaela in her role as a youth peer worker. So we're gonna have a, a, a short um, pre-recorded video from uh, Michaela and Kayla. Thanks, Nicole. Hi everyone. Thank you for having us join your meeting today. I'm Kayla and this is Michaela beside me, a youth peer worker for SPIDA. Uh, we are very thankful to be involved in the SPIDER project um, and throughout this presentation you'll hear some great work that's been completed by Michaela and the Headspace team over the last seven months. So what we will run through with you today, um, an overview of the peer, work, peer worker role, um, integrating youth peer worker role into the Headspace model, um, what has been achieved and worked well, um, what some of the challenges or barriers have been, what are the gaps and what are the opportunities for improvement and sustainability? Hi everyone, I'm Michaela, the youth peer worker here at Headspace and my role is funded by the Western Victorian PHN supporting people with intellectual disability to access healthcare or the SPIDA project. And it aims to improve how primary healthcare services are delivered to meet the needs of people with an intellectual disability. My role in the project has involved working alongside the community and our Headspace team, including people with a lived experience of intellectual disability, as well as their families and carers, disability workers, service providers and advocates, practice nurse and staff, and a multidisciplinary team of mental health professionals. By working with all involved in delivering and receiving primary health services, we aim to improve our understanding of how we as a healthcare provider can better tailor and target those services for local needs. So we have integrated Michaela's role into the Headspace model by having her within the community awareness and engagement team. So this is currently where we have another peer worker for family and friends, as well as myself with a health promotion background. Michaela is supervised by our operations manager alongside myself who oversees the project. Headspace Operations Manager oversees the following programs, Community Awareness and Engagement Team, Work and Study, uh, the Nurse-Led Clinic and Admin Staff. These are more the operational side of the Headspace model. So from here, we, are, we have identified ways in which we can integrate Michaela's, Michaela into the clinical team. We have done this by having our peer workforce involved in clinical case review me meetings, having our peer workforce attend clinical team meetings, presenting different spider-related topics to the whole Headspace team, 
provide secondary consults to clinicians who improve individual, individual client care and co-facilitating with Headspace clinicians in group work sessions. So some things that have been achieved while I've been in the role is delivering awareness sessions to young people with a disability to build their mental health literacy and advise them on how to access mental health services. So I've done that by working with some different group sessions, so Passport to Employment, the Merai River School, Achieve Southwest and the Southwest Haif Foundation Disability Class. Um, delivering health and wellbeing activities to young people with a disability um, I've done this by the Young Child Group here at Headspace, Headspace and Brophy Open Day, the Work and Study Group and Headspace Day celebrations. Developing the, I've been developing the following easy read, mental health and wellbeing resources, internal documents for Headspace and Brophy, mental health and wellbeing resources, accessing Headspace services, alcohol and other drug resources, and inclusive healthcare resources. I've also been able to provide an on-site environmental scan of the Headspace community and youth building, as well as working with a small group of young people to complete an on-site orientation to provide further feedback from their point of view. I've also assisted people living with a disability to access a range of digital supports available to them through the work and study group, secondary, consult, secondary consults, and supporting clients and young people with accessing support groups and further information. Building the capacity of Brophy staff by, pro by providing them with training opportunities to educate them further around working with young people with a disability. I've been able to do this by completing seven clinician drop-in sessions, completing secondary consults with Headspace staff, presenting the youth peer worker role at the Brophy Regional Meeting, I've created a training register for all Headspace clinicians and created a library of resources for Headspace clinicians and staff to access at any time. Advocacy and engagement has been achieved by completing the Young Leaders Program through YDAS, the involvement of Brophy's Diversity and Inclusion Working Group, the Moyne Shire Dis Disability Access and Inclusion Meeting, a proposal for the sensory improvements in our consulting rooms, attending case review and clinical review meetings, and engaging with local stakeholders and fellow peers in the region. I've also completed the wide ass access and inclusion training and presented feedback for Headspace staff, as well as shadowing Headspace staff members as they complete their day-to-day -day tasks, and I provided feedback around what was inclusive and accessible and possible improvements to be made. Some challenges and barriers I have faced is there really isn't too many as the team are very open and willing to make changes where appropriate. Um, a possible change, oh sorry, a possible challenge that has arose is possible funding for the sensory room changes, but the team will do their best to implement what they can. A small barrier personally I have is my health flare-up, so some days or weeks are worse than others and I can't work the full capacity of days. But the Headspace staff have been accommodating with organising my work hours and as well as organising the work from home day when needs. Some current gaps that we have prior to me commencing with Headspace, um, the GP had left so we haven't been able to dive into this area properly. Um, the team now has a remote GP organised to support Hannah, our practice nurse, and I have been able to work closely alongside the primary care team through this process. I've also been working with Hannah to make accessible resources and ensuring that the practice has a more inclusive space and being able before commencing services again. So opportunities for improvements and sustainability. So we are always looking at ways in which we can improve our service and keep up with the ever-changing environments. Michaela is engaging with young people that we may not have engaged with before due to not being aware of or think Headspace is the correct service for them. She's implementing small changes within what we already offer and supporting Headspace to become a local service that is 
accessible and seamless for young people entering a health service, which is often complicated and overwhelming for young people living with an intellectual disability. Michaela is breaking down barriers um, and shows young people with an intellectual disability and their families that we are and can be the right service with her support. Michaela is making a huge impact within not just Headspace but also Brophy. She is a Headspace representative that is participating in the Diversity Inclusion Advocacy Group. Michaela is a young person living with a disability on the Advocacy Group. She will be supporting the lead agency to become more inclusive and accessible organisation for all. And that's all from us today. Thank you all for listening. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you, Michaela and Kayla. And I think it's a great um, demonstration of where we get some integration across our programs, where SPIDE is really enhancing the services that's provided through Headspace that we're already commissioning. So, and when you think about it in the, I guess, hundreds of Headspace centres across the country, this is a bit of a unique model and it's really creating access to a group of people who have been probably left out from access to Headspace um, previously. So, um, so thank you to both Michaela and Kayla. Um, so our next speaker is Letitia Stevens. Um, she's the telehealth disability peer support worker for Grampkins Community Health. Health. This was also a role funded by the SPIDA project. Um, and the role aims to provide upskilling and support for people with an intellectual disability and their supporters to learn how to use telehealth as well as deliver a health and wellbeing podcast. The podcast is freely available and is called Our Community is Able. So again, we'll hear from Letitia through a pre-recorded video. So thank you, Nicole. Hi, my name's Letitia Stevens and I work at Grampians Community Health. I was employed to work in the role as a telehealth disability peer support worker in the Grampians region as one of the trial activities as part of the SPIDER project. This role aimed to deliver a program for upskilling people with an intellectual disability and their supporters on how to access telehealth appointments and video consultations via digital platforms. Telehealth is when you attend a health appointment using technology, like by the use of your phone or a computer. This can be really useful for people living in rural and remote areas and for times that a physical health check with a doctor isn't needed. It is still important to have face-to-face -to -face tele, face-to-face -face health appointments with a GP when needed. By building a person with the lived experience of an intellectual disability's capacity and confidence in using telehealth appointments, this is not only providing a greater access accessibility, but it is it will also support a person's self-determination to manage their own health and well-being to the best of their abilities. The role focuses on three areas, so training and education, information and resources, and engagement and advocacy. Training and education for people with a lived experience of an intellectual disability and their supporters focuses on building technical skills and one-on-one -on -one supports. This could look like learning how to access a telehealth appointment by a phone or video, using a phone calendar to track appointments, the use of voice activation of maps to navigate to appointments, may that be Google or Siri, downloading and accessing health apps like Smiling Mind, phone etiquette, and as well as access into referral pathways. Training was also delivered to disability services and healthcare providers. These group sessions involved a key focus on the importance of telehealth, but also reasonable adjustments. The promotion of telehealth was, or is an effective and efficient way to communicate amongst patients, supporters and health professionals. Offers access to a wide range of health services supports, supports inclusive of medical, mental health and allied health services that otherwise might not be accessible due to the location or other factors. However, we also acknowledge that telehealth does not necessarily replace face to face appointments. Information resources were also made to provide information in an easy to understand way. 
This includes instructional how-tos, written resources and videos on accessing telehealth by the use of phones or computers. One of the clients we were able to use these resources to was to support their independence in accessing telehealth appointments, but also in the future as well too. It is also well known that people with learn in different ways. So Grampian Community, Grampians Community Health also delivers a podcast episode, which are sustainable resources that people can listen to. Some of these topics in the podcasts are disability, peer support and telehealth, Disability Pride, Valid, a peer advocacy organisation in the WIMRA, GP management plans, and other allied health roles like exercise physiologists, dietitians, and occupational therapists. Feedback from clients was that the approach to training and resources supports their confidence in accessing primary health care professionals using telehealth. This worked well for clients as it was considerous, considerations were made for making changes to the learning material so they matched how a person likes to communicate, supporting the individual to learn at their own pace. We were inclusive of those without a formal diagnosis and we were able to collaborate with services across the Rimura region. This could be the private, a private psychologist or a public hospital. The strengths of the peer support worker brings together people with shared experiences to support one another so they feel accepted, understood and equally as important. This work aligns with Article 9, Accessibility of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with a Disability, which says persons with a disabilities have the right to access medical facilities and emergency services on an equal basis to others in the community. And it's really important to highlight, highlight that inclusion is everybody's responsibility. Thanks for listening. Great, thank you, Letitia. And uh, I saw in the chat that Matt's asked the question, do we have access to those podcasts? And um, Letitia's put a link there into the chat so that we can access those through uh, Grampings Health uh, website. So thanks very much, Letitia, for that. And as you say, it's a very important part of meeting those, um, the human rights uh, declaration that um, we create that access for people with intellectual disability. So um, moving on, um, we're going to next hear from two clinics. Um, the first one is the Golden Point Medical Centre and then Health E Medical um, on their trial activity in, um, through the SPIDER program um, of inclusive, uh, inclusive of patient mapping in the framework they're using to implement quality improvement activities and the outcomes identifying all touch points for a patient with the clinic and creating a shared vision for a whole of clinic approach to increasing accessibility for people with an intellectual disability. So um, from Golden Point Medical Centre, we'll be hearing from uh, Anesh Cherian. Uh, Anesh is based out of Ballarat with his family, uh, his wife Nisha and his twin girls. Their journey started in Backers Marsh. Um, they now run, they run a medical specialist service um, called Dove Touch Specialists um, for children, um, together with a paediatrician uh, and other allied health practitioners. Um, presently, they have over 2,000 children coming from across the state um, to receive special care. The children present with multiple needs, such as developmental delays, behavioural and medical um, issues. This journey has led them to open a GP place, uh, so Golden Point Medical Centre in Ballarat, for these children and parents to help provide a safe and welcoming place so the children and others coming through are getting continued help. So I'll pass over to Anesh. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Andrew. Um, I guess I, I just wanted to first thank, uh, thank you for inviting myself to be here. Um, I probably want to start off by saying some of the speakers that we've had from Auntie Jane, Uli and the others, um, I think one of the key things for me was to listen and uh, this listening process has not been easy. So it, it has uh, taken a lot of time, still is, there's a lot of training, uh, PHN's been great, there's a lot of people there that, that constantly support. So. It's, it's a journey, it still is. Um, so what I'd like to do is probably start off there, just give you guys a quick
quick high level view on what we've done and and we it, it's still it's still evolving um so out in ballarat where we have the clinic um um we have a uh, uh, forms. So we started off the center by having forms and we had, I think, uh, four forms, four pages to start off with just to capture things with the patients. And within uh, a few patients conversations, we realized that, hang on, people are sitting there and they're just feeling overwhelmed, just trying to fill the form to just meet the GP. All that they've come to do is get care, get attention, uh, get help. Um, and sometimes with the children running around, the parents themselves get overwhelmed. So that um, started off. So that that journey took us from changing the forms to online so that patients can fill up, the families can fill up in their space, in their time um, at, at home. And, and that sort of gave them the space to fill up, gave them the room to add more things, gave them the room to avoid um, things that they would have otherwise missed. And then it gave room for more conversation. So forms started becoming online. Um, and then from there, we realized that people want to make bookings. And we realized that the software was a limiting factor. So we had to change the software. And the whole software had to be canned. And then we had to change the software to just allow the patients to book, the reception staff to be able to have conversations, to just simply put it in, have the conversation with the um, patients coming in the nurses to do their bit of work and then for the doctors to have it. So it, it became a uh, revolving thing where one led to the other. So the website had to be changed, which still is. The whole medical center layout had to be changed. We had chairs in a way that people felt, um, I guess, intimidated. They were like, OK, well, hang on. I want my space. I want my room. And, and that sort of gave us at the uh, we, we had to change so that children can run, children can be around, but at the same time, if they wanted to sit, uh, that space was there. Um, so that was that. We'll go on to the next slide there. And um, just quickly on that front, um, so that change from an organizational perspective, changes that we did were forms, giving access to information so that when people have information, they get the information, ability to make the booking. And then we had to identify staff there. So reception staff, this is what you can do. We we give them space to have a conversation. What trainings do we need for that? So we had trainings that we had to dedicate to the reception, separate for the nurse, separate for the doctors, and even simple things like calling the patient back. That became a big roadblock in terms of how we have to do it. So sometimes it had to be a simple text message had challenges. So we had to make sure that people, um, some people wanted to be called. So we give the time to give them a call, find out the information, and they have specific time to make the booking. So those were things, and it still is a learning thing for us. Um, in terms of the different patients that we've involved in the journey, there were a whole lot of parents um, with, with children with special needs. So we've actually sat with these mothers with, with predominantly mothers and, and then the dads in some instances, but to, just to sit with them and say, what is a challenge? And, and some of the conversation was, um, I don't feel safe. Some of the conversation was, I feel rushed. So those were conversations that, that took us to actually peel the model on what do we need to provide? What are people looking for? Um, so yeah, that, that was that there. Um, we'll go on to the next slide there. In terms of um, actions that we've taken, um, my wife and myself, uh, we, we just had to realize that we just can't do it normal. Um, if, if we do it exactly the same way as everything else out there, these people feel rushed. They don't feel um, they don't feel answered. They don't feel being listened to. And, and that was hard because uh, my wife tells me that I'm not a good listener, so then I had to practice listening myself, still am. And it, it sort of took us on that journey, and it still is. It's one step at a time. Um, but we had to take ownership at the start, from the from the beginning, from the top, saying that, okay, no, we, we just have to be ready to change, whatever it might be. Um, upskilling staff, we we have staff, and, and sometimes staff feel overwhelmed. If, if you have 
people coming in and and they're not equipped we just realized that 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 won't be there so it, be, it came into a process where we had to have this constant conversation with them change things have templates change um environments allow them to talk out allow them to rent out if that had to be there systems just like i explained before we had to change our whole software the whole software had to be changed get it get the it person in change the whole thing get it happening so that people when they are looking for information wanting to access they've got it access they've got it ready for them in the clinic we had to um, make sure that we are looking at the patient looking at the people and giving them a conversation giving them an opportunity to say hi why how are you what do you want what can we do for you those things that we've started has helped and we're still improving on that. The next slide. Um, in terms of the different impacts and, and where we've done, we can say that it's increased patient satisfaction. Um, it, it has improved um, our um, layout in terms of how we are meeting out and, and reaching out to these people. Um, I've um, one of my conversations was mm -hmm. with an 87 year old gentleman who came through and uh, his his thing was um, Anish I don't feel valued I feel like a number when I go to my medical center it's a number it's a tick off and that um, blew me because um, my, my dad's 78 79 he's overseas but it comes to a point where where do you value these people they're not a number and and that was different the other one was a person in late 20s oh, sorry early 20s um he was just struggling with just thinking getting things straight but having conversation over multiple appointments that we've had he's now told i feel calm so he's told a support worker he's not told us directly yet but he's told a support worker support worker gave us a feedback saying i feel more calm when i come here I'm not agitated anymore. I feel like they're listening to me. So those things are the feedback that they're getting. Um, but but like I said, there's still scope to improve lots more there. Let me just move on to the last slide for us. Um, in terms of inclusion, the key thing for us was um, we need to be mindful that people have their environment, their circumstances, there are surroundings which is impacting on the way that they might come out and and for us it was making sure that we provide that room for them to converse not saying no um there, there's a way to to give them room and as long as we give them a room there is a story they have to say and that story is important whatever that might be and um in terms of satisfaction it's is it is it sustainable um it's hard work sincerely it's 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 really hard work to just go through the whole thing um but i think the best part about it is we can see the difference that it's making to people's lives so if it is one person at a time well so be it so that's that's our journey thank you thank you very much anish and um yeah it's really great to hear that journey and the willingness to take the journey. I think the frenetic pace of medicine and general practice in general, I think, you know, it would just be so great if more could have that same approach to taking the time and, uh, you know, making it accessible. I think, you know, particularly in intellectual disability, um, there's a lot of talk about behaviours of protest and so on and, you know, probably two thirds or more of the time, the behavior of protest is in fact due to an underlying medical condition or an irritation or a lack of understanding um, in communication or whatever it is. And if people just slow down, understand this and actually look for what the underlying cause is, many of these things go away and people who have been classified all their lives as difficult, um, in fact, have much, much improved lives. So. I think you know uh, what you're doing is um, is fabulous. So thank you very much. Um, 
So we're going to move on to our next clinic. Um, so I want to introduce um, uh, Health E Medical Centre, uh, in particular Megan Frisch, who's the co-nurse manager, and Dana Slorach, who's the practice nurse. Um, Megan completed her Bachelor of Nursing degree at Deakin um, and uh, continues her love for Geelong in both community practice and nursing fields. Um, and she's been at Health E Medical since 2012. Um, she's got three beautiful children and provides um, nothing but compassionate care in the work setting. So she's completed further studies in immunisation, wound care, ear health, drug and alcohol testing, um, and uh, has a, a well-rounded general practice knowledge. Um, Dana has um, uh, worked in GP, GP practices as, as a medical receptionist um, and then completed Bachelor of Nursing at Fed Uni in 2021 um, and is now nursing with, uh, um, with um, Clinic eHealth e Centre. Um, so um, Dana support, enjoys chronic disease management and working with a supportive team in the treatment room. She's also a nurse immuniser and has qualifications in micro ear suction, drug and alcohol testing, and works closely with um, Department of Veteran Affairs patients uh, as part of the Coordinated Veterans Care Program. So we've got a pre-recorded um, uh, piece from Dana and um, Megan. So we'll play that next. Thanks, Nicole. Okay, so um, I'll tell you a little bit about our practice here. So Healthy Medical Centre is a large general practice situated in Geelong, West Victoria. We have an active patient base of over 13,000 patients from a wide range of cultural and socioeconomic backgrounds. Uh, participation in this trial was important to our practice to be able to improve access and provide inclusive care to our patients with intellectual disabilities. Um, our aim with this activity is to improve our process for the CHAPS assessment appointments for eligible patients to improve their health outcomes, but to also uh, build effective relationships with all staff within the practice to give patients and their carers the confidence to discuss and be proactive regarding their health needs. Uh, what we're doing here at Healthy, so currently we're in the process of making alterations to our clinic website, um, like adding an audio reader. Um, as well as ensuring the language used is appropriate, positive and inclusive as per the Victorian government guidelines. We're placing notes on patient files for specific needs um, and carer contact details. These notes are added to the patient details of the software and may include that a person prefers to wait in a quiet room rather than waiting in the waiting room, as well as the main carer's name or the preferred method of contact. Um, we are working on making our um, accessible toilet doors easier to open. Um, currently, our toilet doors are really heavy to open um, and to hold the access and have the door open. We're in the process of getting quotes to be able to change these to automatic doors with a push button to make them easier and safer to access. Uh, streamlining process, the CHAPS appointments with the nurse and the GP. Our clinic has a fantastic streamlined system with our 75 plus health assessments. So we'd like to use a similar process with the CHAPS appointments, uh, leading to a higher percentage of uptake for these assessments. Uh, staff training to improve our knowledge and purpose of the CHAPS tool. And we're adding recalls um, to each person's file that have had a CHAPS assessment within the last 12 months. Updating the invitation to participate letter. These letters have been developed and include information as to what a CHAPS assessment is and includes easy to read information for patients and their carers. Um, outcomes and impacts. Effective reporting of the outcomes of the tasks on the previous slide then allow us to um, establish methods for patient feedback for continued improvement leading to the practice to be able to continually refine this process. We would be developing action plans with timelines for the completion of enhancement tasks, completions of the PDSAs to improve accessibility and enhancements, and improve patient diagnosis reporting using codable diagnosis in practice software. Um, inclusion and sustainability. Um, so inclusion, so being an inclusive practice for our patients, ensuring our patients have an equal right to access all medical facilities and emergency services. 
build confidence to discuss issues with their providers and staff, um, identify health needs early, prevents hospital admissions. Um, being sustainable, um, to make this project sustainable for our practice um, and to ensure that access remains inclusive for all our patients, we must add recalls and reminders added to patient files at the completion of their appointments, um, being using regular polar searches for new patients to send invitation letters and continued import from GPs, nurses and allied health providers. Great, thank you to Dana and Megan for that um, that update. And as you can see, there's a lot of change that um, practices sort of can work their way through to become more accessible. Um, and I think that's the challenge for us with our 225 practices across the region that there's probably four or five or six that are on the journey and we really need to get all of them on the journey. So um, we're, we're going well, so we're up to uh, Rob, who's going to be our last speaker today. Um, so Dr. Robert Ward is a GP who's been um, a facilitator of SPIDER's online education series, so the ECHO series throughout this um, program. Um, he studied medicine originally at Melbourne, returned to Geelong um, and was a resident at the Geelong Hospital before entering general practice 27 years ago. Um, the birth of his son 25 years ago introduced him to the world of intellectual disability and to local service providers. He's been a board member of Gateway Support Services for the last 23 years. Um, he's experienced disability from the perspective of a busy general practice through the eyes of a parent and the challenges of a large provider of disability services. He's also observed patients' and families' journeys over a period of time where the service provision for disability has undergone a seismic shift with the introduction of the NDIA. More recently, he's been involved with um, West Vic and the SPIDER project, exploring the challenges faced by people living with intellectual disability, accessing healthcare, and the health disparity that they experience. So we've got a, a um, short video from Rob, and um, we'll play that now. Thanks, Nicole. Hi everyone, um, my name is Rob Ward and I'm a GP in Geelong and I was wanting to share with you today my experience of working with the SPIDER team on the, on the SPIDER project um, to help improve the health access for people with intellectual disability to the healthcare system. So I've been a GP for, for 30 years and I've also got a 20 to 7 year old son who's got an intellectual disability so this project sort of uh, is quite special to me and I've probably got a fair few patients um, with an intellectual disability as well. So learning how I can improve um, peer interaction to the, the health system was a really important part of getting involved in this project for me. And I wanted to share with you today some of the people that I've met and some of the ideas that, that I've learned and how I'm going to move forward um, with what I've learned through the SPIDER project to date. So it's probably worthwhile just very briefly going back to July 2021 when the National Roadmap for Improving the Health of Inter People with Intellectual Disability was released. And to remind ourselves that you know half a million Australians live with an intellectual disability of some form and they have a much higher rate of emergency department presentations and hospitalisations and have twice the rate of preventable deaths than the general population with significantly higher physical and mental health conditions. Um, they also have a lower rates of preventative health care and also identify people with intellectual disability having lower rates of health literacy and also health professionals often having minimal or no skills um, or lack the knowledge um, to look after people with an intellectual disability in any effective way. Um, and that's really where the birth of the, the SPIDER project came to be from this national roadmap and the federal government's initiatives. So I suppose born out of the National Roadmap was the SPIDER project, which was the Westfix PHNs initiative. Um, and that is supporting people with an intellectual disability access health. And it was designed to support the capacity of the primary healthcare system to deliver better health outcomes for people with an intellectual disability. And I suppose this is where I became involved as a GP with a special interest in intellectual disability. And I've met a lot of wonderful people along the way and I've learnt so much and I just wanted to share a little bit about that with you um, now. 
So I think it's important just to look at who was involved in the process early on and really great credit goes to Kerry and Nicole from the spider team from Westwick um, PHN. They've done an incredible job at linking so many professionals together, um, so many people with an interest in this area and try to corral us all and connect us all and try to make sense of this whole um, difficult and complex area of providing healthcare to people with intellectual disability. Now, I was on the reference group um, with Nicole and Kerry, and we also on that group, we had participants, so people with an intellectual disability, we had their parents, we had carers, um, we had paediatricians, we had public health experts and service providers. So those people who in the community provide services to people um, with intellectual disability. And together we worked on um, various ways of delivering health. And I suppose a lot of my involvement was um, on delivering um, some um, internet based um, meetings and educational um, sessions designed at primary health care, uh, probably with a focus on general practice, but all those who provide um, primary health care um, to people with an intellectual disability in our community. So Nicole and Kerry were experts in um, gathering a whole load of magnificent subject matter experts um, for these sessions. And I, I got to meet them um, as facilitator of the web-based um, webinars that, that we produced. And we produced a whole series of um, informative sort of sessions and had great, great discussions about lots of aspects of um, providing healthcare to people with intellectual disability. So I'm sorry, this list is, is quite, the writing's so small, but the list kept getting bigger and bigger as I thought about the, the wonderful people I'd met and who helped deliver these um, educational packages. Um, first one, the, um, the participants and people with a lived experience um, with intellectual disability and their carers. Um, we provide, we had some great insight into um, some of the difficulties um, faced by people with intellectual disability in accessing the primary health care system as it's set up. And it was almost quite worrying how difficult that was and the problems um, that they faced um, during this time. I really appreciated the, the personal insight and stories um, these people were able to bring to the table um, to, to deliver these, these sessions. Um, particularly, I, I learned the, the term reasonable adjustments. Um, which meant that from a primary health point of view, um, small adjustments we do to our practice can make a huge difference to how someone can access our services. Um, and also learned about barriers that I never thought existed. Um, I just want to go through some, some of the people we met. Um, obviously, mental health is a, is a huge issue with intellectual disability as well. Um, and the psychiatrists, um, both local and international, spoke at these sessions. Um, and we spoke about the difficulties in, in diagnosis, the difficulties um, in medication, and particularly the issues of over-medication in people with an intellectual disability. Uh, we spoke to speech therapists about communication um, for people with an intellectual disability, often communicating um, non-verbal ways um, and ways to improve that communication. Um, from people with an intellectual disability. And the other thing that struck me is it's not just communicating with um, the, the person or the patient communicating with, with doctors and the health system. It's also the way we communicate and provide information, both verbal and written, and try to get that in a way that our, our patients can actually understand. And that's part of those reasonable adjustments is maybe thinking about different ways we can do that. And the speech therapists gave wonderful insight into that. We spoke to dietitians about the importance of diet and nutrition, not only on um, uh, not only on your general health, but on, on sort of preventative health in the in the future. And you know that all comes down to um, you know, how healthy your gums are, how healthy your teeth are, your risk of infections, and yeah, you know, the, the the food we use. And that also got um, discussions going about how we how people with an intellectual disability um, access food and who as primary health carers, we're supporting people to have a healthy diet. And it also goes back to um, how we communicate that. We spoke to diabetic educators 
um, and the importance of um, adequate education, especially for those people in the care sector. Uh, people with intellectual disability have a higher incidence of diabetes and obviously the control can be more of a challenge. Um, we spoke to legal experts and that was, that was fascinating about, um, particularly about consent um, and when a person can consent and also about administrative um, orders and um, legal issues like that. So that, that was really important. Um, we had pharmacists. So once again, we, we spoke about um, medications and how often people with intellectual disability um, have uh, over-prescribed medication, particularly to um, try to control behaviours, whereas it may not be the most appropriate, um, most appropriate way to go. Um, one of the interesting things that was brought up is that often, well, sometimes people with intellectual disability are prescribed medications that have a side effect that because people are non-verbal, they would have a great deal of difficulty in um, expressing that to their GP. And that was a, really a revelation to me that we could be causing them side effects that they can't even explain to us. We spoke to behavioural support practitioners, which is a GP I hadn't really come across in the past, or they've just been on the periphery. But I'm certainly a lot more aware of them through the SPIDER project. And you know, engaging them um, to have more, whole, more holistic approaches to um, people's behaviour and wellbeing. We spoke to health policy experts, you know, high up in government advisory areas, um, and that, that was amazing to see where they're coming from and really to be reassured there's a lot of good work being done by a lot of fantastic people um, high up. And they do think about things um, and they are really open to listening um, to the concerns of the people more at the coalface here. Some of the other services, the Victorian Dual Disability Service, um, particularly talking about um, that dual disability of intellectual disability with mental health. We had the Centre for Development and Disability Health at Monash Health, invaluable in their insight into um, the health systems and accessing health um, services for people with intellectual disability. We spoke to the Office of the Senior Practitioner, particularly about the abuse of psychotropics. And of course, we had specialist paediatricians um, involved in this service. So that was um, really interesting to get their insight into that early, early aspects. And the other one was an important one, the, the, the transition specialists. So that we, we learned that the, it's really important, the transition, the transitions through, through life uh, for people with intellectual disability are a point of vulnerability and they're really important to plan for and to manage because um, we know they're going to happen. So we had some wonderful sessions with all these people and they're all got recorded and they're all available on the PHN website somewhere. Um, so please look them up if you want to, because they're, they're fascinating um, people and fascinating um, experiences to, to learn from. So what, what, what did we learn? Um, I certainly learned that people with intellectual disability face way too many barriers affecting their access to healthcare. And as a consequence of a lot of them, their health outcomes are not as good as they, as they should be. And a lot of those barriers um, are actually, actually just the, the system that we've, we set up and we um, haven't made any adjustments or it's a one size fits all and people with intellectual disability face a lot of barriers at trying to access that system. Well, an interesting thing, intellectual disability is not just a paediatric health issue. I mean, certainly as, as doctors and medical students were often taught about um, intellectual disability as a paediatric subject or with the paediatricians and, you know, in those first 18 years, the paediatricians are sort of the experts and then all of a sudden uh, that person is launched into the adult world and that's where they face a, face a lot of barriers. So intellectual disability is not a paediatric health issue. Necessarily, it's a lifelong issue that will transcend many therapists, it will transcend the GP. One GP is not going to be there for the entire journey. You know, the parents are not going to be there for the entire journey. Um, and we need to sort of plan and think long term when we're looking after people people's health um, from the health system. Um, communication is really important. And that's the communication, particularly um, not just with the with the patients and with the practitioners, but also 
um, b between practitioners because often there's not a lot of chatting at the moment between um, health professionals and that's a, a big barrier and could be um, we could do better. Um, access, improving access to um, appointments and improving access, you know, either financially um, make services available or just have them available, um, the services that people with intellectual disability um, need. I spoke about reasonable adjustments before, that was, that was a term that I just only le really learnt through the SPIDER project, but it's, an, it's such an important thing that we all take on board in primary care. And I also learned that transitions, as I said before, are really important because they're going to happen. They're planable, they're predictable, and they're a point of vulnerability where health information gets lost. You know, transitions between um, different practitioners, different carers, different stages of life, um, very vulnerable time for people with intellectual disability. You know, and if, if you fast forward, you know, five, 10, 20 years, it's those transition points where the information has got lost and the health outcome is not as good. So we also learned that care can be quite fragmented um, due to poor communication between health professionals. And we also learned that there's a, um, an over or inappropriate medication um, use in people with intellectual disability, often with consequences of side effects um, and poor outcomes. There was a big section on the annual health assessment, how important it is um, to take some time um, every 12 months to just take stock of where we are and we learned about the CHAP tool um, and the use of that and I'm sure with the, um, the roadmap and its emphasis on the CHAP tool and the developments that are going on there it will be more accessible to GPs which is a really fantastic tool. Um, learned the team approach is really important you know we can't do everything um, as individuals we need to get out and communicate and talk to each other um, the other thing I learned, there are really many professionals out there who are highly committed and highly passionate and highly skilled with people with intellectual disability. Um, just pity we can't clone them and, and put them more around, um, but there's a lot of people doing some great work there. The other thing I often learn is sometimes a system change is needed. You know, it's not just an individual practitioner um, making their practice more available, but there's sometimes bigger things need to be changed in the whole system that we've created. So personally with the SPIDER project, um, I've been involved in, in the training sessions and the subsequent webinars. It's also led me to presenting to um, the West Vic Perchin annual general meeting and the annual symposium, um, trying to increase the awareness of people with intellectual disability. And I've also been invited to, um, to present at a number of um, paediatric conferences for paediatricians both in Sydney and Melbourne at the Royal Children's Hospital to bring about a general practice perspective, so more from the primary health setting. I think that's been really valuable adding um, our perspective um, to that of the specialist group in the paediatric years. Um, and I've also had ongoing involvement with the Office of the Senior Practitioner and with assessing the annual health assessment tool to try to improve that. And that's both been very rewarding for me. So just a few takeaway points, because I know I've gone over time. Just the importance of listening, um, documenting what's going on and the, the journey of the patient, because um, they're not going to be your patient forever, but to document that for the next, the next stage of their life. Being more proactive in advocating for our patients, um, working as a team, trying to find out who else is available and making sure that you contact them. Trying to give a little bit more time and a little bit of thought um, into how um, we can, we can better support our patients is really important. And also not accepting the system as being anywhere good enough and advocating for change and improving when we see um, room for improvement and just being really passionate about that. So look, th thanks, for, thanks for the time and thanks for having me here today. From a general practice point of view, it's been an amazing experience. Um, and I hope the resources we've produced will be helpful. Uh, for people to look at and I hope we continue to improve the access of people with intellectual disability moving forward um, in the future. So thank you and have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Um, thanks to Rob. Um, I, I think the thing that stands out to me is, you know, Rob with almost 30 years of experience in this space um, is learning so much through the SIDA process. 
program, which I think is both shows the, the absolute need for it, but also um, you know, what the team has achieved in terms of you know bringing new knowledge and connection and relationships into this um, into this space. And I guess the thing reflection is that in our new strategy, health equity is one of the core strategies that we're um, uh, focusing on, and we're starting to do more work in the diversity and inclusion space. So. You know, this is the sort of where the rubber hits the road, where we've got to make sure that we do think about um, people with intellectual disability across all of the programs that we run and what are the access barriers and so on, and take that broader view of what are we trying to achieve in, in all of our programs. The, the other thing I think that's important to note is that um, for this year, the, the theme is around um, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. and particularly around um, you know, putting effort into achieving those goals, but also doing it with um, and by and for people with inter intellectual disability. And, you know, in my role on a disability um, provider board, um, we reflect a lot on climate change and what impact that's going to have, because we have to have action plans for bushfire response and so on for group homes and so on and and what do we do on high heat days and how do we make sure that people who don't necessarily have the capacity to manage their own environment can you know are appropriately cared for in environments so so I think you know that the, the you know Leah's leading a really important piece of work on sustainability and you now environmental and social governance um, and I think that the with the theme this year of looking at those um, UN sustainable development goals with this lens gives us another opportunity to, to look at things a little bit um, a little bit differently. So um, so yeah again thanks to everybody who's come along today. Um, as, a, as I mentioned um, the actual day is the 3rd of December so maybe take some time on the 3rd of December to also reflect a little bit on the discussions today. I want to thank all of the people who came along and presented today and particularly Anesh and Uli who came um, and spoke uh, in person today. And thank you to those who also provided the pre-recorded um, sessions.